I want to introduce you today to a new podcast that's a little bit different from the podcast I've shared with you in the past. This one is the Amateur Traveler Podcast, and it's hosted by my friend, Chris Christensen. Now, I've known Chris for a really long time at this point. I began listening to the Amateur Traveler back in 2008 when I was traveling through Southeast Asia. I binged every single episode of the Amateur Traveler podcast when I was in Indonesia, and then I actually reached out to Chris to see if he wanted to have me on as a guest. And I appeared for the very first time. I called in from an internet cafe in Yogyakarta, Indonesia, and I talked about my trip to Micronesia. And that was the very first time that I was a guest on the Amateur Traveler. Since then, I have appeared on the Amateur Traveler podcast as a guest more than anyone else. I think 20 times at this point. Not only that, but in 2009, I actually started a podcast with Chris Christensen, and we were the co-hosts of This Week in Travel for 11 years. If you include This Week in Travel, The Amateur Traveler, I've appeared with Chris on hundreds of podcast episodes, and we've actually done them live on several different continents. So the episode you're about to listen to is my most recent guest appearance on The Amateur Traveler. I did this last year, and I talked about traveling to Rome and visiting the hidden places that a lot of people never visit. Chris has been doing the show since 2005, so any place you can think of that you might want to visit, he's probably done an episode about it. He's done over 800 of them so far. So enjoy this episode of The Amateur Traveler, where I am the guest. And if you like the show, you can subscribe wherever you're listening to this podcast. And if you want to do some research on a travel destination, you can probably find a podcast episode about it, by visiting AmateurTraveler.com, and I have a link to that down in the show notes. So, enjoy the episode. I got my bags packed on a roll, I'm heading out there, and I'm ready to go. I'm looking real good in my passport photo. Oh, no. Amateur Traveler, episode 751. Today, the Amateur Traveler talks about triumphal arches and basilicas, Holy Steps and the Holy Sea, the Colosseum and the Catacombs, as we go to the Eternal City, Rome, Italy. Welcome to the Amateur Traveler. I'm your host, Chris Christensen. Let's talk about Rome. I'd like to welcome back to the show Gary Art, who has come to talk to us about Rome, Italy. Gary, welcome back to the show. Thank you for having me. Now, Gary has been on the show so many times that I don't know that I can possibly go through every episode he has been on. We've done a lot of different things around the world with Gary, one of the most common, well, most, uh, (laughs) I don't want to say you're common, Gary, one of the guests who has come back on the most number of times. You are thinking about doing tours just on Rome for a week. Yeah, so kind of give the background. Since I've last been on The Amateur Traveler, I launched a new podcast. Uh, it's called Everything Everywhere Daily. Right. Not a travel show per se, but it deals with a lot of interesting stuff. And in the course of doing it, I've done several episodes. I have several more on things dealing with Rome, the Roman Empire. And I was thinking of ways I could do tours and how I could do it differently. And for most tours, if it's a group tour, you do two days in Rome. Right. Then you go to Florence. Then you go to Venice. That kind of stuff. So if you're with a bus tour or on a cruise ship, you're going to see the highlights of Rome. Right. And nothing wrong with that. But there is a lot of stuff in Rome. And I do mean a lot, a lot of stuff. (laughs) I mean, we're talking 2,500 years of history layered on top of each other with all sorts of stuff that's really interesting that most people don't even know is there. Right. And what I really want to do, um, I'll probably do it for several different cities, but I wanted to start with Rome because I think it's so rich. And there's so much that if you just go there on a normal tour, you're never going to see this stuff. Most of these things that we're going to talk about today, I've been to personally because I'm kind of a geek about those things. And when you visit, there's nobody there. Some of the very best parts of Rome get no tourists because everyone's going to the Colosseum sure. and the Forum. Mm-hmm. They're going to the Vatican. Right. They're going to the Trevi Fountain, and that's Rome for everybody. Yet there's a whole, whole lot there. And if you're in the slightest bit intellectually curious, which I'm assuming most of the people listening to this are, there's some amazing things to see. Excellent. Well, what kind of itinerary are you going to recommend for us? 
All right, so I'm assuming that you've either been to Rome before, you've seen those highlights that I've just mentioned. I'm not saying don't go to the Vatican. I'm not saying don't right. go to the Colosseum. But I'm saying you're probably going to do those things well, first or right away. Let's talk about some of those then first. You named four. I think it's a great four. Uh, within there, there's a couple other things. So the Colosseum, for instance, very easy to find right downtown in Rome. If you're going to do the Colosseum, I'm going to recommend you do a VIP tour and go underneath it and see some of the tunnels that you can see now, which I don't think you used to be able to see years ago. Yeah, most people don't do that, right? and that's going to actually play into some of the things I'm going to talk about. And the Colosseum is also right next to the Forum, Mm -hmm. or it's easy walking distance. And along the way, you're just going to walk past the Arch of Titus, right? which I think you should definitely look at, and actually look at the engravings on it, because one of the things you'll notice on the Arch of Titus is a great big menorah. Yeah, because it was Titus that was responsible for the sack of Jerusalem. Right. And that was one of the treasures that they brought back for his triumph in Rome. And that's still preserved there today. So that's a kind of an interesting bit of history where you start to see the classical Roman stuff and also Christianity and Judaism crossing paths and some sort of Venn diagram that's in the middle. You'll also see a couple other triumphal arches in this area, the right. Arch of Septimius Severus and the mm-hmm. Arch of Constantine, Constantine mm-hmm. which you should definitely look at. And in the ro- in the forum itself, there's lots of ruins. You should look for something. I did an episode of this on my podcast, which was the Milius Aurea, which was the Golden Mile. And this was the mile zero marker right. for Rome. So if you've heard the expression, all roads lead to Rome, mm-hmm. well, technically, all roads lead to that spot in Rome. <laughs> and right. that is how they measured everything was from literally that spot. And it's really nothing to see. I think it was a column supposedly wrapped in bronze, I think, on a pedestal. And I think only – I mean only the pedestal is left. But next to the Arch of Septimius Severus, you'll also find a spot which was called the Navel of the City. Oh, I forgot that. Oh, and that yeah, was okay. like truly ground zero and that was mm-hmm. sort of used before the Milia Aurea was. And they're right next to each other. So I don't know why, but the Golden Mile marker was created by Augustus. So it's probably just more of a public thing that people could see. Regardless of what you do in the forum, get a guide. Yes. Because it's so – Yep. Packed with stuff that <laughs> yep. if you're just walking around, it just looks like old stuff. And you can't really get a flavor for what happened if you're just walking around. Yeah, I did the tour last time I was there from our friends at Live Italy who have been sponsors of this show. But uh, Gary and I actually both know some of the people from that company. And that was the VIP tour. That's the one that lets you skip the line also at the Coliseum, which is <laughs> – <laughs> that can be an hour long. So skipping the line there is always a good idea. And then you get to go higher than other people do, and you get to go lower than other people do, down and see some of the trap doors and things in the Colosseum that let the wild beasts out and such. So and you mentioned the Arch of Titus, so Titus being one of the Flavian dynasty, and they're the ones who built the Colosseum, which is why that's the one that's nearest to there. And then I think that tour also then goes up to the Palatine Hill. So it goes up to the palaces right. above the Forum, which are uh, interesting to see as well. And and not unusual for people to see, although I, I think my family skipped the Palatine Hill when we went there the first time. I think a lot of people do. Yeah, because they don't really know the history. Uh, Augustus Had his villa there. Later emperors did. That's where uh, Caligula was killed. They had a spot that overlooked the Circus Maximus. There's not a whole lot to see for the Circus Maximus nowadays, but there is a a field that you can clearly tell it's like an elongated oval still. And that would be where they did the chariot races in ancient days. Correct. Yeah. Which was a far bigger deal than gladiatorial games. I think the gladiatorial games are sexy for cinema. But it was the chariots racing that day in, day out were the things that people followed. And they had some fanatical teams. Oh, yeah. And the teams were always just identified by colors. And the two biggest colors that turned into rival political gangs during the time. Uh, the greens and the blues. The greens and the blues during the time of uh, Marius and Stella, wasn't it? Uh, no, that was more. That was much later. It was much later? Okay, that's why I couldn't remember. When they had the big riots, that was in Constantinople. Okay. The Nika riots, where they literally burned down the city and the teams went against each other. But supposedly the fire uh, that occurred in Rome, the Great Rome fire started at or near the Circus Maximus. So like I said, this is – there's so much history. Right. And I would even recommend don't get a guidebook for Rome. Get a history book. Get like Mary Beard's SPQR if you don't have a knowledge of Rome. 
because there truly is so much stuff. And it's not just like, oh, this is the Julius Caesar time. Rome really was around for several centuries after that where a lot of the stuff right. was built. Mm-hmm. And speaking of Julius Caesar, they think, oh, well, I'm in the forum. This is where Caesar was assassinated. No, Caesar was actually assassinated at Pompey's Theater, which today I believe is in the basement of a restaurant. (laughs) The Senate actually was meeting somewhere else at the time, Mm. not in the forum, and that's where it occurred. Excellent. But you can see the old Senate building there, the rostrum and other things where the Senate – did do things. Yeah, the Temple of Jupiter, I yep. think you can see some of the remains mm-hmm. and, and some other things as well. And like I said, if you don't have someone telling you what's what, it's just going to look like a bunch of old stuff. <laughs> yeah, that sounds about right. So then you mentioned three other places that people are going to see. The Vatican, you mentioned. Okay, so with with the Vatican, yeah. yeah. One thing I recommend if if you want to book a tour is to go take a tour of the Vatican Garden. Not many people do this. I have not done that. Because at the end of the tour, it ends at the museum. Okay. And you don't have to wait in line for the museum, plus <laughs> it includes your cost of entry. Mm-hmm. And quite frankly, if you really want to explore the country by foot, most of the country of the Vatican t- is taken up by the gardens. Right. You'll get to see other interesting things in the back, like they have the Radio Vaticana Tower and just other stuff that they have there, as well as seeing the museum. Well, and it seems like the things that people do see when they go to the Vatican is they rush to the Sistine Chapel, which is almost always crowded, especially in the middle of the day, and spectacular. You ought to see it. Although many people are rushing through all of the art on the way there, like the map room and things that I think are worth seeing, worth stopping and looking at. And then they see St. Peter's, they see... Michelangelo's Pieta, and then they leave and go see something else. Yeah, and a bit of a tip. Most of the tour buses that show up are going to show up between like 8 and 10 a.m. And I remember one day I was there. I was in line, really long line, like went around the whole country. And (laughs) by the time I got in, I had a camera bag, so I had to check my, my bag in a locker. I get done with the Vatican Museum, and I have to go back to the entrance to get my bag. Everything, and this was about noon, the lines were gone because the the line was just there in the morning because of all the buses. So if you visit the Vatican a little later in the day, I think you're going to have a much better experience, especially for something like the Sistine Chapel, if you're one of the last people to go through than one of the first. And also the St. Peter's Basilica itself is, is tends to be a bit more empty in the afternoon. But there are two things I was going to mention. One is you can go all the way up to the very top of the dome of St. Peter's. And there is, in fact, even a gift shop and a cafe on the roof of the Vatican, of the St. Peter's. Get out. <laughs> yeah. I did not know yeah, that. So in the, in the dome, there's like an inner dome and an outer dome. Yeah. And you walk in between it, mm-hmm. and it takes you all the way up to the observation deck at the very top. Most mm-hmm. people don't do it. It's an awkward walk because the walls are tilted because sure. it's a dome. But you can do it. And if you want a fantastic view and photo of St. Peter's Square, that's probably going to be one of your best places to do it. Hmm. The other thing, and this is something very few people get to do. So the Vatican was built where it was because that's where the tomb of St. Peter was. Right. So when the Emperor Constantine built a basilica, this is called Old St. Peter's, on that spot. And then in the Renaissance, it was falling apart, so they built – New St. Peter's, which is the building that's there today. Mm -hmm. Underneath St. Peter's is an area called the Grotto, and that's where a lot of popes are buried. John Paul II, for example, is buried there. That's pretty easy to get into, and that level is actually the floor level of old St. Peter's. Okay. Below that is the area called the Scavi, and there's an office of the Scavi, and the Scavi was an excavate, Italian for excavation, which was done during and after World War II. Because Pope Pius X wanted to be buried as close as possible to where Peter was. Hmm. So they conducted this excavation, and they found the Roman cemetery, which was there. And it wasn't a cemetery as in graves in the ground. It was like actual buildings with walls and stuff. And they found the area with Petrus on it. And a lot of the very early bishops of Rome were also interred around him. Hmm. And you can visit this, but they only do it in very small groups, and you have to reserve it beforehand. And I think this is 
one of the coolest things in Rome. And it is something you can't take pictures. Like I said, it has to be in a small group. And it's right below the altar because that's why it was put where it is. And the altar of New St. Peter's is exactly where the altar of Old St. Peter's was. Hmm. So that would be the thing if you really want to see something different in the Vatican is what you do. The other buried thing that a lot of people don't get to see is Nero's palace, the Domus Aurea. Nero built the – was probably the biggest building in all of antiquity. Right. It was enormous. It had supposedly had a colonnade that was like a mile long. It had an artificial lake, and after he died, they basically tore most of it down, and they built the Flavian Amphitheater, a.k.a. the Colosseum, where that artificial lake was, for example. And the name Colosseum comes from the fact that there was a colossus built in that spot, which was a – like a hundred foot tall statue of Nero. Oh, I didn't remember. That's who I knew it was a statue, but I didn't remember it was Nero. Okay. Well, it was Nero. And then when Nero died, they changed the head, took up his head off and changed the head. Yeah. And <laughs> they changed it into the sun God or whatever, yeah, but yeah. it was the Colossus. And that's where Colosseum comes from, right. from the Colossus. They rediscovered the Domus Aurea during the Renaissance. Hmm. It, it had been buried or at least one wing of it. And the Renaissance painters, would be dropped down there by rope because it was all the paintings were still preserved. Hmm. And it's kind of like Pompeii to that extent where all these fantastic paintings were preserved because it was buried and you can go there. There are tickets available. You don't have to get dropped down a rope anymore, but <laughs> he had these rooms that you had the stars painted on the ceiling and they had a rotating ceiling and there'd be slaves hired to make it rotate by ropes because it was on a pulley system really elaborate for the time. And yeah, again, hardly anyone even knows about it, let alone visits. Hmm. Now he built this after the fire, as I recall. Correct. And the, the reason why the legends existed as to that Nero started the fire right. was because he basically was extremely opportunistic after the fire in clearing a ton of land to build this palace. Right. And the other place I'd recommend, uh, this gets a few more visitors is St. Paul's Outside the Wall. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I talked about the original St. Peter's Basilica. Basilica has two meanings. One, it is sort of any church that has significance that the Catholic Church just says, well, this is an important church, either architecturally, historically, whatever, and it's called a basilica. Right. That's just a title granted to it. However, a basilica was also a particular architectural style that existed in the very early church, which was adopted from – Roman buildings. Right. And mm -hmm. this style is what the old St. Peter's used to be, and St. Paul's is what it is. St. Paul's was heavily renovated in the 19th century. So if you go there today, it's going to look like a brand new church almost. The colors are bright. You've got gold gilded everything, and it looks really nice. But the layout of sort of like three aisles and the, the shape of everything, mm -hmm. that's all the original building. And it's the same thing you'll see at the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem, actually, that mm -hmm. same style, because the churches both date back to Roman imperial times. And the reason why it's there is because uh, just as St. Peter's was the tomb of St. Peter, so too was this the spot supposedly of St. Paul, where he died. And they believe that the – I believe it's a skull of St. Paul is still under the altar in a box or something, hmm. but it's a very good way to see that architectural style, which you otherwise can't really see. And I should add that there are, I don't know, there's like a thousand, some basilicas in the world and they're all Basilica minor. Okay. There are four basilicas called Basilica major. All four of those are in Rome and it's St. Peter's, St. Paul's, St. Mary's major and St. John's Lateran. And all four of those are probably worth it. Again, most people don't bother with anything other than St. Peter's. Hmm. Well, and you mentioned that it's based on a Roman style. There's still one of the ancient Roman basilicas in the Forum, which isn't a church at all. It would be a right. judicial building, as I recall. Yes, the original basilica comes from this style of building, which mm -hmm. was actually not a religious. It wasn't the design of the temples. Right. It was just the design of like public civic buildings. Right. That's where mm -hmm. they took it from. The other thing is is one that I've not been to because it just opened up, the Tomb of Augustus. Right. This was a huge piece of the Roman landscape for a very long time, and it fell into disrepair. 
And the last time I was in Rome, there was still fencing around it. You couldn't go visit. But now it's been reopened. And I think that is not just Augustus's tomb, but many of the very early emperors in Rome were entombed there because everyone wanted to follow in the footsteps of Augustus. So they wanted to get put in the tomb with Augustus. So they would put their ashes in there. Now, it's a round building, but I don't remember where it's located. Oh, man, I couldn't even tell you off the top of my head okay. the exact location. But super easy to find on a map and open now. So you, even if you took a tour or something, there's a good chance you're probably going to – or you got on a hop-on, hop-off bus. There's a good chance that you're going to be able to uh, get within walking distance. Okay, it's over by the Vatican. We would jumped around here a little bit. We've been in two spots, the Colosseum, the Forum, the Palatine Hill are in one spot. Vatican City is further to the west across the River, river Tiber. And the Castle uh, St. Angelo is across the river from there, and up a little ways is the Mausoleum of Augustus. Not far from the Pantheon, either. Oh, that was going to be my next thing. <laughs> Castle St. <San> Angelo <laughs> was originally not the Castle St. Angelo. It was Hadrian's tomb, and it later got converted to a castle. Uh, I'd for- God that, that you can visit okay. as well, and that, even though it doesn't look it from the outside, actually has Roman origins. Yeah, by the time Hadrian was around, he's like, yeah, I want my own tomb. So, <laughs> And then we're going to be getting back to Hadrian in a bit. Okay. We talk about stuff that's immediately outside of Rome that you can easily just day trip to. The other, probably the oldest thing in Rome that you can go see, and probably, I don't know how you verify it, the oldest continually used thing in the world that it's still used for its original intent is the Qualoca Maxima which is the Roman sewer. <laughs> it was built not during the Republican period, but during the kingdom of Rome. Oh, wow. So it's really old. And they were super proud of their sewers. Like many Roman writers centuries later bragged about their sewers and how awesome their sewers were. They did an upkeep on it, I think, during the reign of Augustus. They cleaned it out. But it's still there, and it is still functioning as a sewer today. I have looked – to find if it's possible to get a tour of it, because I know that there are other cities like Paris where you can get tours of the sewer. Right. But there are there is a spot, and I forget the name of the bridge, where you can actually see where the Coloca Maxima empties out into the Tiber. And that might be as good as it gets, but it actually goes under the forum. And hmm. like I said, it's, it's still draining water. The Ponte Roto, the Ponte Roto uh, bridge near the Ponte Palatino. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Just so you know. (laughs) And speaking of Augustus, the other thing we should probably mention is the Arapacus, which is the altar to peace, the altar to Augustan peace, actually. Mm -hmm. And it is really well done as a piece of art. It's not an altar like you might think of it. It's actually kind of a small building with really elaborate engravings around it. And it's small enough that it's totally enclosed now by a modern building. But it's very high quality in terms of how well it has been preserved and small enough that it doesn't grab a lot of people's attention. And like I said, you can probably map all this stuff out because even the times I've been to Rome, I have yet to ever go on the subway in Rome, just to give you an idea. I just always walk everywhere because there's always something you can see, even with a few blocks. And, and just as a general thing to look for everywhere in Rome – The College of Cardinals was originally established. They were the priests and deacons of the various parish churches in Rome. Okay. And as it expanded and they started getting bishops from other places, the tradition to this day is that each member of the College of Cardinals is assigned a church in Rome. So if you look outside of any Roman church when you walk by, you will see a coat of arms. And that coat of arms is going to be different for every church, and it corresponds to the cardinal from wherever they may be in the world who is the mentor or the overseer or the benefactor for Hmm. that church. And what they've done in the past is they would sometimes assign cardinals from rich countries to the poorer churches so they could help raise money for them. Hmm. And in a lot of these churches, you can just walk in and you'll see beautiful art in what is basically a neighborhood parish church. And that's something at least to to keep your eye out for, is to look for those coats of arms that are above all the churches. Another church that is 
often overlooked is the mm-hmm. Basilica of St. Mary of the Angels and the Martyrs. This is very close to the train station, and the exterior of it is basically a Roman ruin. It was the Bath of Diocletian, and okay. it was converted into a church, and inside it's absolutely beautiful. It's at the Republica Plaza. So that's a, a big roundabout, again, really close to the train station, super easy walking distance. This is overlooked by a lot of people. So this is kind of a twofer. You get the Renaissance <laughs> church aspect of it with all the artwork that's mm-hmm. very neat. Plus, you get the Baths of Diocletian for the, the Roman stuff. Kind of, I wouldn't say it's quite like the Pantheon, but that also was kind of a part Roman, part church. Right. The reason why it was preserved is because it was turned into a church. Right. And and beautiful building, too. It's more commonly visited and worth a visit. Inside, it's beautiful. I think a lot of people looking from the outside would have no idea what's inside of it. True. The word basilica is outside, and I don't know. If you didn't know what you were looking at, you might not know. I remember walking past it, and I had my camera. I was just walking around, so I went inside, and I was like, wow, this is great. And they had some fantastic sculptures and paintings. And there's this very neat thing in the floor that's like a meridian, and it's kind of like a sundial that's okay. used, commissioned mm-hmm. by one of the early popes. And that building actually was the national church for the Kingdom of Italy from late 19th to early 20th century, just before the rise of Mussolini. Huh. I did not know that. Well, and you say a sundial because there is a uh, an oculus, a, a sun roof, <laughs> as it were. <laughs> there is a hole in the roof at the top, and so you can do a sundial indoors. And I think they even used that as one of the filming locations for one of the Dan Brown movies. Oh, yeah, they did. It's the thing in the floor, except they completely every, – every Dan Brown book is horrible. <laughs> I I actually liked Angels and Demons, which is that one, but okay. <laughs> There's so much historically wrong. Sure. About oh, that yeah. Movie. No, it's... <laughs> and I don't even mean like the conspiracy stuff that I can accept for suspense of disbelief, but a couple other cool things that are passed up. The Sacred Stairs or the Holy Stairs. These are close to the Basilica of St. John's Lateran. And St. John's Lateran, by the way, is another very old church, used to be the resident of the Pope's. And St. John's Lateran is the cathedral for the city of Rome, not okay. St. Peter's. Well, is, is that in a completely different country? So, Well, no, it's not just that. But <laughs> even before the creation of Vatican City, yep. it's a basilica. It's not the cathedral. The cathedral sure. is St. John's. It's more of a nomenclature thing. but Well, and the other thing, and we've talked about it on the show before, but something doesn't become a th- cathedral unless it has the seat of the bishop. Yeah, but, it's just the official yeah. church of the bishop for whatever diocese. Right. And mm-hmm. so that that is it. That's the Pope's church, is St. John's Lateran, not St. Peter's. Now, that is a much newer church in style. Not – no, actually, it's been redone a lot. Got it. Okay. So if you go in, it's going to look new. But actually, I believe the core of that church is older than the current St. Peter's because they tore down all of old St. Peter's to build the current one, whereas St. John's has Got just it. been – updated over time, kind of like St. Paul's in that you go in and it looks new, whereas it actually is pretty old. Okay. The facade is from 1735 is what I'm reading. And it was obviously a newer facade, but uh, the inside is really different looking. I've had a a couple of guides tell me about this, that Americans tend to be more fussy about whether something was original than European. (laughs) Right. Well, because original is is a matter of degrees anyway. Well, yeah, because you have this old building and it needs to be fixed and right. updated. And so there's going to be new things added, but it's still the original building. And for Americans, it's like, oh, is that is the actual thing put there at that time? Right. But the next two, or not too far from there, are the Scala Sancta, which is the Holy Steps. The Scala Sancta are the steps which were supposedly taken from Pilate's Palace in huh. Jerusalem. And they were taken back in the Crusades and basically reconstructed in Rome. So it's this building with a set of stairs up the middle, and the stairs go nowhere. (laughs) It's just a wall and I think an altar at the top, and that's it. And a lot of people will go up on their knees or whatever, but supposedly they are the same stairs that Jesus would have walked up. Hmm. Because there's actually very little in Jerusalem that dates back actually to the time of Christ because it was a much smaller city at the time, and the city today is really more of an Ottoman city. Right. Well, and that and the Flavians did a number on it. So, 
Well, yeah, <laughs> not a whole lot left. The other thing I'll I'll mention, and people might have seen photos of this, but they may not have done it themselves, the keyhole photo. So if you go to the headquarters of the Knights of St. John Hospitaller, also known as the Knights of Malta, and if you go up to their main wooden door, you'll see a gigantic keyhole. And if you look through that keyhole, by chance, it is perfectly aligned with an archway in their garden and the dome of St. Peter's Basilica. And that is a very famous photo. You can t- It's a very huh. difficult photo to take because you're shooting through a keyhole and getting everything in focus and at the right exposure level is difficult because most of it's black because right. the keyhole, but it can be done. Hopefully you don't go there when a bus group shows up because otherwise <laughs> you're going to be waiting a long time. I've been there a couple times. One time I had no problem. I was there by myself. And the other time there was a bus group and I just sat and waited because it just wasn't worth it. Hmm. Well, an interesting group historically to the knights who ran hospitals uh, in the Holy Land, among other things. Yeah, and uh, they actually, the Knights of Malta, have diplomatic relations with many countries. And the headquarters in Rome, some people will quasi sort of consider it to be an independent country, huh. but it's it's not quite. It doesn't have the same official status as, say, the Vatican does even though people have – imagine if the holy – people had diplomatic relations with the Holy See, and there's right. a distinction between the Holy See and Vatican City. The Knights of Malta are like the Holy See in that it's an organization, okay. but the land it's on doesn't necessarily have sovereignty the way Vatican City does. Hmm. But you can say you went there, and that's kind of a, an interesting thing. Now, so far, everything we've talked about, you mentioned walking, I think – it's a mile from the Colosseum to Vatican City, and the train station is another 2,000 feet in one direction. We've really been in the core of the old city. We haven't gone very far at all. Well, St. Paul's is something you'd probably have to take a taxi to get to. Okay. That is, as the name would suggest, outside the walls. Outside the walls. I mean, <laughs> it's in modern Rome, but right. there are buses that go there, so you can do public transportation, or I took a taxi when I went. And I should also just go back to St. Paul's. There's portraits of every pope inside St. Paul's. That's hmm. one of the, the features of it. And I remember, I think it was with Pope Benedict or something, or maybe it was Pope Francis, there was only one spot left because they had gone all the way around the building. So I don't know where they, <laughs> they, they put the last portrait in or where they moved it to. So you're in Rome, mm-hmm. but there are a couple of great places outside of Rome. They're within a 45-minute driving distance or a local train or a bus that you can get to. That, again, most people don't ever bother to see the stuff outside of Rome because there, there's so much stuff inside of Rome. And the first I'll mention is a place I know you've been to, which is Ostia Antica. Right. Mm-hmm. Ostia was the port city of Rome because Rome is not on the sea. So Ostia is where the Tiber meets the sea. And oddly enough, today, I think it's like two kilometers from the coast because there's been so much silting of the river over the last 2,000 years that Ostia is actually no longer on the sea. But the ruins of Ostia are really good. I would say that they're maybe not quite on a par with Pompeii because you didn't have the artwork that was preserved and things like that. Right. But all of the buildings in the market, they still have all of the mosaics in the floor, the tiles for the fish vendor. Right. They have a picture of a fish and all this stuff. Uh, The toilets are still there. Way too communal for me, the toilets, but that's a different (laughs) – Right. But this amazing Roman ruin, which is arguably better than anything in Rome itself in terms of how much of it is preserved, right? it's all there. And it's – again, there were very few people when I was there. I don't know what it was like when you were there, but it was basically oh, nothing. Yeah. No, I, I went there with a, a guide again uh, because it is one of those sites that you could walk through and not know what you're looking at. I don't remember whether it was a – context travel guide or something I found on Viator, but it was somebody who knew archaeology and such. But yeah, I I don't even remember any bus groups or any groups of any particular size. Uh, no, lovely stroll in the countryside. And I was in Rome in August, which is not what I would recommend when to go to Rome, but I was there at the end of a press trip. And it was nice to get out of the city, too, to some place that had a little more, a little more breeze, a little more outdoor destination. I took a train there. Yep. 
Mm-hmm. So it's very easy to take an above ground train from Rome to Ostia. Highly recommend it. Uh, especially if you wanted to go see something like a Pompeii, but it's too far away and you didn't have the time. Ostia is a great place to do it, and it's really not that far. Yeah, I quite enjoyed it. Yeah, and as always, get a guide if possible, just because mm-hmm. it makes the whole thing easier. Going in the other direction, so that's towards the sea, up in the hills just outside of Rome, and you can see the hills from within Rome quite easily, is the town of Tivoli. Mm-hmm. And there are two things up there that are both World Heritage Sites, well worth seeing. One is the Villa de Est. The Villa de Est is a Renaissance-era villa created by a cardinal who desperately wanted to be pope. And he spent a ton of money on this garden and created one of the most elaborate water gardens in the world. In addition to just being a, a garden, it just has tons of fountains, running water, waterfalls, sculpture, that's all over the here. And it's just amazing. And he built it to basically impress the other cardinals in an attempt to try to become Pope. Uh, and it didn't work, but <laughs> today you can enjoy it. And I should say this actually does get of the things outside of Rome. This probably gets the most people because there are some bus tours that will visit the Villa de Est, hmm. but still nothing compared to what you're going to get within the city of Rome itself. And the other one, also in Tivoli, just outside of town, is Hadrian's Villa. Mm -hmm. And wow, this is amazing. So he basically built a palace outside of Rome. So he's up in the hills where it's a little cooler in the summer. And again, it's this fantastic Roman ruin. So much of it's still standing. And the best part is there's this one area around, I wouldn't call it a swimming pool, but it's more like a reflecting pool, where they still have a lot of the original sculptures sitting around the pool. Hmm. If you've ever seen the movie Spartacus, there was a scene where it it takes place around a pool and it looks very similar to that. There's this amazing dining room that he had that was built on an island and you can still see that. The roofs are are off a lot of the stuff and it's a lot of walls, but there was truly no one there when I visited that no Hmm. one cared at all about this. And you can easily visit both the Villa de Est and uh, Hadrian's Villa on the same trip. You can go to one in the afternoon, one in the morning, no problem. The other thing I would highly recommend, and there's several of these you can visit, but I would go to at least one of them, is to go to one of the catacombs, Mm -hmm. which dot the entire city of Rome. Most of the catacombs are Christian catacombs. Right. So this is where very early saints were laid. This is where the very early Christian community would meet. They would often have church services on graves of respected people in the church. There are also, however, some Jewish catacombs. And I actually got to visit a Jewish catacomb on one of my trips there. They don't do tours very often, but they just happened to be doing it this one time. And they asked me, it's like, well, do you want to go see this? I'm like, well, sure. You can see a lot of Jewish iconography. The Star of David actually is a rather modern Jewish symbol. It was usually the menorah which was used. Okay, and makes sense. Rome had the largest Jewish community for several centuries after the fall of Jerusalem, mm-hmm. after the Jewish diaspora. Rome was the largest Jewish city in the world for quite a while. And that's reflected in the size of some of the catacombs and their very existence. And there's even more stuff that I didn't even talk about. If you really wanted to get into the nitty gritty, there are some, and some of them are not quite as well preserved. But there are some triumphal gates that are outside of Rome that today are just sort of a road that's going through like the the walls of Rome. Part of the walls are still there in some places, not in all places. There is the Pyramid of Cestius. It is a pyramid in Rome, not oh, super yeah. huge, and it's rather steep. And it was basically built by this one Roman who wanted to be remembered. So he built this really kick-ass tomb for himself and his wife. And it's still there, and you can still see it, and it's basically a pyramid. If you're ever driving around Rome and you see a pyramid, this is it, because there are just any other pyramids. And if you're taking the train to Ostia, it's like a, right across from the train station where I picked the train up, is the, the reason that I've seen it. I think, however, I, I remember listening to another podcast about this. They only do – it's only open a few days a week. Hmm. So it's not a seven-day-a-week type thing. So mm-hmm. you might want to check the schedules if you want to uh, check it out. I've not actually – I've been past it a few times but I've never actually gone inside. And inside is not that special. It's pretty plain. But it's, again, just another one of these interesting things that's all over. Trajan's column 
is fantastic. And that's something too, where even if you can take out your phone and pull up some information on it while you're looking at it, mm-hmm. because it's basically a spiraled story right. pictograph that goes around it that tells about all the accomplishments of Trajan. If you at least have that as a guide, you can go look at the, oh, that's where he conquered those people. That's where they did this, <laughs> as opposed to just looking at old stuff. And then the Mamertine prison is located very close to the forum, very close to Trajan's column in that area, but it's up near the street from it. It's not very big. The Romans didn't really have prisons. They had places where they would hold people before trial. But putting people in jail was not a regular punishment for the Romans. They would just kill you or lop off a limb or fine you or whatever. But they didn't have the resources to throw into guards and and prisons and everything. So this is where Peter and Paul were both held. And I think it was a church or maybe a church still technically where they occasionally hold services there. There's an altar that's definitely there. On the altar, there's an upside-down cross. Oh, okay. Peter. Exactly. So it's, it's something you're not normally going to see in most churches, but specifically for this one, because Peter was supposedly crucified upside down, they have an upside down cross in recognition of Peter. Right. Peter basically is supposed to have said, and this is not biblical, obviously, because it takes place after that time period, but in early church histories that he is supposed to have said, I'm not worthy to be crucified like uh, like Jesus, and so crucify me upside down which um, is not how it was normally done. And as another interesting tidbit, you'll notice that in the very middle of St. Peter's Square, there's an obelisk, which is an odd thing to have in the center of a Christian thing. Well, the reason why that's there is because that was taken from Egypt Mm -hmm. by the Romans, and that was supposedly, so there was another circus in the area of the Vatican, around that area, where that was where Peter was supposedly executed. And that obelisk was there. So supposedly it was witness or in the vicinity where Peter died, and which is why it was then placed in the middle of St. Peter's Square. Okay. I did not know that. It didn't have a cross on it originally, obviously. No, they they put that on later. But a lot of people think it's kind of weird that there's an Egyptian obelisk in the middle of Vatican City. Right, Uh, But that's the reason. It's because it was originally taken by the Romans, and it happened to be in this place, and they put it front and center in the middle of the plaza then. Now, we've talked about a lot of the history, uh, some of the UNESCO World Heritage Sites, obviously, since both, well, Gary is a collector. I, I also like to get to them, but I'm I'm sure a thousand <laughs> behind you in terms of how many I've been to. But while you're in Rome, are there other things that you would recommend that people do that are more places to eat, places to hang out, throw your coin in the Trevi Fountain, or those sort of things? If you want to throw your money away in the Trevi Fountain, <laughs> go for it. So the restaurant where Caesar was killed, not that he was killed at the restaurant, <laughs> Godfather style. It's right. Da Pen Cronzio. It's, it's just a regular Italian restaurant, and they just so happen to have lucked out and built it on top of Pompey's Theater. And if you eat there, the owners will let you down in the basement where you can actually see the place where Caesar was killed. I have – Nothing to say about the food quality there. I'm I'm (laughs) sure it's fine. It seems to have good reviews on TripAdvisor, but it's more of the fact that it's historically interesting. Excellent. Anything, And and you don't need to order the Caesar salad. That's not a Roman thing. Anything else that people ought to do, see, or eat while they're in Rome? Take your time when going through St. Peter's Basilica. Yeah. In the museum. Mm -hmm. Like, just use a whole day for that because – It's just full of art and history and significance everywhere. There's just so much of it. And it's so easy to walk by this stuff and not know what it is. Whether it's – there's this inside St. Peter's, there's a a bronze statue of St. Peter. Right. And the toe is (laughs) – Rubbed off. (laughs) It's eroded away. Yeah. And that's because people rub it. Supposedly, I think you'll come back to Rome or something if you rub it. And I, th- I thought you'd have luck if you did that versus if you throw a coin in the fountain, you'll have you'll come back. But I don't or know. you could rub the fountain and throw a coin. <laughs> throw a coin in the t- Peter. So there's like four major statues at the corners. I think Peter was one. I think Saint Longinus was one. Longinus hmm. was supposedly the Roman soldier that stuck the spear in the side of Christ. And there's also a legend that God, as punishment, 
made him immortal and he was forced to walk the earth and fight in all the wars as punishment and and never get to die until christ returns and what movie was that made into Oh, a couple. <laughs> I was going to say, there's got to be a movie version of that. <laughs> no, there is. I think there's one called Longinus huh. that basically tells the story of the immortal guy. But there's a lot of those things that are, like I said, they're just everywhere. And we haven't talked about like the Spanish steps, which, right. quite frankly, it's only called the Spanish steps in English. It's a great photo. You'll see a lot of pictures where people are just sitting on it, eating or drinking, which I think is technically illegal now. Right. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want people. We haven't talked about the Pantheon which is, again, perhaps the best preserved Roman building right. in the world, just because it was turned into a church, still has, I think it's the largest concrete, unsupported concrete dome in the world. And it's hmm. close to 2,000 years old. One of the great things is on the front of the building, in big letters, you'll see the word Agrippa. He was the number two guy to Augustus. And had he not died earlier, he may have become an emperor and taken over from Augustus, but he didn't. Also, if you look around it, there's a road going around the Pantheon, and it's kind of raised up. And in sort of a, a micro level, you can see, you always dig to find ruins and cities. Right. And it's always like, well, how did stuff get that far below the surface? And because the Pantheon hasn't moved, everything around it's been built up. And you can actually see that it's actually one to two meters below the rest of the street level on hmm. either side of it but not in the front, actually, where the plaza is around it. Hmm. Interesting. As we start to think about wrapping this up, Gary, you're a photographer. Your favorite photo spots in Rome? Okay, one would definitely be the keyhole The photo. keyhole, I figured that. I, I searched for the keyhole, and I found everything-everywhere.com, which is Gary's site, so I knew that was going to be one. Okay. So there's this one street, Via Piccolomini. It is up on a hill. And the hill is such that it is on the same level as the Dome of St. Peter's. Okay. And basically, you if you're on the middle of the street, there's a little overlook. So you're way above the rooftops, and it's just the dome. And this is probably one of the best spots to take a photo of the Dome of St. Peter's itself. But it. it's kind of out of your way. And most of the people that are going to be there are going to be there just for that photo. Okay. And if you're inside St. Peter's Basilica, you're going to have, especially in the late afternoon, most probably, depending on the time of year you're there and the weather and everything else, you're going to see beams of light coming through the windows up in the basilica that can give you some really great effects. Mm -hmm. And I would definitely be looking for that. But you're only going to see that either earlier in the morning or later in the afternoon because middle of the day, the light's going to be going straight down, especially if you happen to be there in the summer. Okay. Excellent. One thing that makes you laugh and say only in Rome. Well, I don't know if it's only in Rome, but it's one of the few cities left in the world that still has pickpockets. Pickpocketing, most people don't realize, is a skill. It's like an actual right. talent that's passed on from generation to generation. And for the most part, it's died out. Yet one of the pickpocketing capitals are probably Rome and Barcelona. It's a place where you really have to be aware of your possessions and your wallet and things like that. And that's one of the reasons I've never taken the subway in Rome. Oh, I just yeah. walk everywhere <laughs> and you don't have to worry about it so much. The other thing, I, this is something I just do traveling everywhere now. And I've, in fact, I do it every day, no matter where I am, is I always put my wallet in my front pocket. Right. Yeah. And that's just a habit that I've gotten into. Mm -hmm. I was in Rome the first time way back in around the year 2000, probably about 1998 or something like that. And there were 10 people in the group that I was with. We were going to a friend's birthday party who decided he wanted to celebrate it in Italy. And so some of us went to Rome before then. And of the 10, two were pickpocketed in Rome. So we had about 20% pickpocket rate. One was pickpocketed on the subway. <laughs> and basically, he was pickpocketed. His wallet was in his back pocket. The doors are closing the subway. Someone grabs his wallet and jumps off the train and uh, people noticed right away. He didn't notice what was going on. And then the other one was pickpocketed at the Coliseum, and the person basically was begging for money and said, give me money, give me money, and some kid, and he said no. And they said, well, how about for this, and held up his wallet. So he, he bought back his wallet. So that was a, a less than terrible experience there. But, uh, yeah, definitely watch your stuff. Not a, if you're going to use a money belt or something like that, Rome would be a good place to do it. I was going to say Napoli also would be another place that I would uh, want to 
potentially have my stuff in a money belt or something like that. Gary, if you had to summarize Rome in just three words, what three words would you use? Old, really old, (laughs) really, really old. (laughs) Maybe also toss in religious Catholic, but yeah. A lot of cities in the world have history, obviously, right. but nothing quite matches Rome just because of not only the history that the city had, but how much of it is still there. There's a lot of cities that had a lot of history, but it just didn't survive to the modern era. But in Rome, you can still see so much of it. Excellent. And Gary, if people wanted to learn more about the tours you're going to do and, and get on a waiting list for whenever the dates get set, where should they go? Obviously, for COVID reasons, can't really announce any dates or anything yet. Yep. But the goal is to have basically super geeky deep dive tours. <laughs> One city, you go to your hotel room once, and that's it. We're not going to move around. And a lot of the stuff we've just talked about in the show is what we're going to be covering. Going to see these little things that are just really cool and interesting. Just uh, check out my podcast, Everything Everywhere Daily. Yeah, it's a daily show. I'm a listener. Yeah, I'll be talking about it on the show uh, every so often, especially as we get closer to a point where we can actually start thinking of traveling again. And I'm also thinking of doing it for a couple other cities as well. I've identified Istanbul and Jerusalem as two cities where I think that you could do a similar super deep dive oh, yeah. and see a lot of the things that you can't see on a two or three day stay. Well, and you were saying that Rome is is unusual in terms of how much history it's left, and those are the two cities I thought of as a counterexample of cities that have just so much history there that it's just layer on layer, and they're fascinating places. And then obviously Istanbul and Jerusalem being much more of a a mixture of cultures too. So I would easily see that being an interesting place to spend a week or so. Excellent. Our guest again has been Gary Arndt from everything-everywhere.com and the Everything Everywhere podcast, wherever fine podcasts are given away freely. Gary, thanks for coming on Amateur Traveler and sharing with us your love for Rome. Thank you for having me. In news of the community, first thanks to those who support the show through Patreon, patreon.com slash amateur traveler for learning more about how to do that. Last week's show, I gave you an update on my travels, and apparently I mispronounced Tiburon as saying Tiburon because there's a U in there that I'm not supposed to pronounce. But I have gone there and gone back and gone to Angel Island and written that all up on the blog. So if you're interested in Tiburon near San Francisco or Angel Island, you can see that on the AmateurTraveler.com blog or on CaliforniaTravelMedia.com. Also coming up on there will be a trip down to Paso Robles, the wine country down there that I'll be going to this weekend. But for now, I've got trips to prepare for and things to do. So we're going to wrap up this show. If you have any questions, send an email to host at AmateurTraveler.com or better yet, leave a comment on this episode at AmateurTraveler.com. And thanks so much for listening. <laughs>